Good morning, John. Good morning, Chris. Thank you for having me on your show. You are very welcome. You are you are literally all over the place. Um, you, you're, you've, you've been interviewed in almost every sort of weekend magazine. Your book has been reviewed uh, to within an inch of its life. How have you found the last few days since the book has been out? Huge fun. It's a great opportunity to get out, to try to sell one's messages and to engage with people. And inevitably, of course, it's a mixed bag. It's unpredictable. Different people have different opinions. That's the joy and vibrancy of democracy. Some people will like my book, some people won't. I'm completely relaxed about that. I would just like to trumpet it as strongly as I can. And I suppose just to underline the point that it's Merely my candid account, Chris, of my topsy turvy existence. Okay, topsy turvy existence within politics, within and without politics. So at school, um, you know, we, we have witnessed you as Speaker of the House of Commons speak in your mind. And it was always us, wasn't it, really? Because you found yourself in a minority at school? Yes, I was in a minority very often at school. I wasn't very popular and I was rather argumentative. I know one supply teacher once described me disobligingly and pejoratively as a walking dictionary. That was, as I say, disobliging. He wasn't complimenting me in any way. I think he found me extremely irritating, and perhaps I was. My dad, I think in 1975 at the dinner table, said, John, generally speaking, is generally speaking. Some people fought with their fists, yep. particularly at secondary school, which could be quite rough. I tended to fight back with words. What did you want to be when you were little? Oh, when I was little, I wanted to be a professional tennis player. Right. My first hero was Ilya Nastasi, the uh -huh. Romanian tennis genius and maestro, but he was volatile, temperamental, unreliable. Compelling. He was a compelling player to watch, but I remember my coach saying to me, John, I would much rather commend to you Pancho Gonzalez, a name I hadn't heard, and he said the reason why I recommend Gonzalez as somebody you should study and try to imitate is that as well as being a brilliant player, Gonzalez was a terrific fighter. He never quit, and he told me a story about how Gonzalez had come back virtually from certain defeat in five hours, 12 minutes, age 41, to win at Wimbledon. And that's always been a guiding light, Chris. I know it's really odd. Your listeners will probably think it's bizarre. But I've had that story in my head since I was <laughs> eight. That. And you're talking with yeah. clenched fists. Now, they're not cl <laughs> clenched fists of anger. They're clenched fists of passion. Uh, but you're a very passionate man. I am. Uh, and after, the show, after nine o'clock, we've got this guy called Tony Riddle, who is, who, who's, um, he's sort of the king of nature. He's a barefoot runner. He, he lives in nature. He has no furniture in his house. And he, he sort of couldn't be more different to you from, from the way he lives his life. I'd like to know mentally, uh, you know, from a psychological point of view, how close or how distant you are apart. Do you, do you work on relaxing? Because you do, you do in the heat at the moment you get so wound up you know and in psychological terms you'd say you you're drawn into unconsciousness you know okay uh, your pain body might be at your your past might be evident it might all be but it's probably not who you really are do you, do you ever i mean you're, you're famous for this you, you don't seem to be frightened of it have you ever done any work on that or taken a pause or i've worked to engender calm and to relax <laughs> and the way i do it right. is by <laughs> Going swimming right. or playing tennis. Right. I mean, it may seem very strange, but for me, mental well-being conduces to physical well-being and to the an other extent way around. vice versa. Yeah. So I'm not a good swimmer. My wife, Sally, always says to me, you're an absolutely lousy swimmer, completely useless. Your technique's utterly substandard. But at least you do it. And my approach to swimming is like my approach to most things. I'm not very good at it, but I just keep going. I never stop. So I'll swim for a minimum of 45 minutes and a maximum of an hour. And I just plod inadequately back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But at the end of it, I feel mildly virtuous, Chris. Right, so so that's before you go into the House of Commons. But, so yeah. in the, but in the in the heat... And now, I still do it now. In fact, we moved on the 1st of November from Speaker's House in Westminster to our home in Battersea, and that very day, deliberately, I went to join a new health club and to have my first swim <laughs> that day, the 1st of November, and I've been going three or four times a week ever since. You're so earnest about everything. Even that answer was an earnest... <laughs> it doesn't require <laughs> earnestness, but, but you are so earnest with your answers. I can't help it, it's, it's me. It's, it's so funny, though, isn't because like, because um, humour, you know, a, a, a touch of humour, a drip of humour goes an awful long way. And, uh, you, you know, 
when you're in those heated debates or you were in the Houses of Commons, especially over the last three or four years, the Brexit years, you know, and you, you th I think because I was watching it, and we were all sort of addicted to it, we were all obsessed with it, you know, and it, it was it was great sports, you know. I mean, yes. I know it was a very serious business, but from an entertainment point of view, uh, which I know is maybe a shallow way of looking at it, but it was great sport. But there were times when you were all so sort of, up in the clouds with your fury yeah. and you, th you thought my goodness me when are you it would be good it would have been a good moment there for you to imagine you were swimming and just go yeah Phew. well i tried <laughs> i mean i tried now and again right. to calm things down yeah with the deployment of humor and by saying things like calm <laughs> zen <laughs> There's a long way to go. Or I would say to a member, and I know Ken Clark, the father of the house, didn't mind this at all. Right. I would say to a member, order, the honourable gentleman should seek to emulate the Buddha-like calm of the father of the house, who is sitting calmly and respectfully listening to colleagues, or words to that effect. But that'll only wind that person up more, and you Probably. knew that as well, didn't you? Well, I thought it was a reasonable <laughs> right. way to try to diffuse the tension. So, uh, so uh, past, uh, past uh, idols, Elena Stasi, and Gonzalez, was it you talked about? Pancho Gonzalez, okay. but my biggest tennis hero of all Roger time Federer. is Federer. Okay. I mean, Roger Federer walks on water as far okay. as I'm when did you last play? Demigod. When did you last play tennis? I know you last watched him last week, didn't you? Yes, I watched uh, Roger Federer last week on the box. When did I last play? I last played on the Sunday before last. I didn't play yesterday because I was doing Broadcasting House, but I played with a good friend of mine and former parliamentary colleague on the Sunday before last, eight days ago. All right, and how good are you at tennis? I'm a competent very club good. player. Is no. he? Very, very good Have you good seen him playing? No, but I just, I know. Oh, I know yeah. from people who've seen you. You were the former British number one junior, weren't you? Well, only for what? a very, very, very yeah. short period no, of but you don't, when I was you, 12. You don't become British number one well, top British. I mean, that, you're a proper tennis player. I think that I always say that the Prime Minister is better at politics than he is at tennis. And you know, you we did him. compete against each yeah. other. We played three sets and he took his six love, six love, six love <laughs> defeat. <laughs> very good bagel. grace, and on which you, I congratulate you. Say that out loud whenever you possibly can. All <laughs> uh, right, I've got to go. You, you, as I say, you don't pull any punches in this, but listen to this, what John Berger says about trees on my own page, 317 of his uh, new biography, Unspeakable, uh, which was out last Thursday. Here we go. Uh, as we have seen, Andrea Letham uh, felt obliged after a misjudged comment about Theresa May not being a mother to withdraw from the leadership contest, allowing May to become Prime Minister without the burden of having to... Uh, traipse around the country for two months in pursuit of the votes of party members, although no one said or even necessarily thought at the time, I believe, that the absence of a contest was highly significant. Theresa May is decent, but as wooden as your average coffee table, a worthy public servant, but as dull as ditch water, courtesy to everyone, but lacking in an ounce of small talk with anyone. Uh, honest, but lacking any original convictions as capable as the next politician of reading a script, but devoid of any spontaneity or, or natural fluency, let alone charisma. I mean, you're really nailing those, ha you're really hammering those nails in there, aren't you? Well, I you're, think it's you're best to be all no, I know, but I mean, you, you, I mean... The short answer to your question is yes. I mean, I suppose it's a very blunt verdict. Yeah. But I thought that people quite like the idea of people saying exactly what they think. I can't, for the life of me, see the point of penning an autobiography or a memoir yeah. and hedging one's bets and refusing to say what one really thinks yeah. and just being diplomatic about people. What's the point of that? I mean, somebody said the other day that a remark I'd made about... Michael Gove was not original. Well, it may not be original to say that Michael, amongst his many qualities, suffers from the defect of being oleaginous, but it does have the advantage of being true. It's also a great word. It is. Um, what, did you, what did you say of David Cameron? I can't remember the exact quote you said. Well, I think I said that he was born with a silver trolley service in his mouth, yeah. and although he was very dexterous and adroit and fleet of foot at the dispatch box and so on, he was, frankly, very snobbish. Okay. I mean, I experienced that over decades. David always had a, a great air of superiority about him. He was very capable, but he was relentlessly tactical rather than strategic. He didn't have a strategic view of the country. He tended to fly by the seat of his pants and to rest on his natural ability to hack it. And most of the time he did hack it, but of course he famously ran out of luck and led the European Union situation in the way that he did. He caused Britain because of his misjudgment on the referendum, to leave the European Union as he would see it by accident. He didn't contrive that. Yep. He didn't want that mm -hmm. to happen. He wanted the UK to stay in the EU, but he felt obliged to call a referendum. He absolutely didn't have to call a referendum, but he seemed to think that he should, and it went the wrong way. He was, to be fair to him, I think very gracious and statesmanlike in then saying, well, I didn't get what I tried to persuade the country to accept, namely remain, 
people have voted to leave, therefore I think I should make way for someone else. And he's often been criticised for that. And of all the things for which I criticise David Cameron, that isn't one of them. It seems to me perfectly reasonable for him to say, well, it's time to hand Not over for me. to someone else. OK. Do you have any sense, John, of how it's doing as, as, as sales figures and things? Do you, do you get a sense no, of that? No, I think I'll get the first sales figures tomorrow. What do you think, though? What do you feel? What's the vibe? I think it will do quite well. I think you're never going to compete with, you know, hugely popular practical books like books about cookery and so on. I think that's really difficult, and that's only one example. I mean, it's a niche market, people who are interested in Parliament and politics and Brexit, but I would have thought there'd be more interest now than there would have been a few years ago. Yeah. And the focus on Parliament, as you implied a few minutes ago, Chris, has been much greater, and the atmosphere much more high-octane, sometimes almost toxic, because of Brexit. Whether that will help me sell my book, I don't know. But look, the truth of the matter is that whether it sells big or sells small or sells somewhere in the middle, it's a book I wanted to write yep. because it's my own candid and authentic account yeah, of what I've experienced. It's, it's out there, it's out of you, it's down on paper, and that helps you to move on. It pr provides you with some closure, doesn't it, I suppose? Yeah, yeah exactly. And uh, the thing about Brexit was, you know, they say... they st One of my favourite quotes of all time is people do not buy how they think. They buy usually with their emotional brain and they think with their intellectual brain. And, you know, and Brexit was a very emotional sort of uh, buy, wasn't it, in a way? Um, yeah, maybe, I think that's, maybe that's a good point. That's what won it for... Yeah, I don't think the judgment was made by the electorate on the basis of a study of the intricacies yeah, of feeling. the customs union or the single market. I think people had an instinctive sense. And the further away you got from London, the more people resented the political establishment. And I absolutely admit that I, for one, underestimated that. I thought, on balance, that David Cameron probably would win and remain would win, not by a huge margin. And I underestimated the extent to which we were, if you like, dislocated from much of the country who felt a great resentment on many, many fronts. Some of it was anti-immigration, wrongly, in my view, and misguidedly. I think immigration has been good for the country. But a lot of people felt that they were ignored, downtrodden, not heard, disrespected, and that all played into the way in which they voted in the referendum, which, as you say, was more on the basis, perhaps, of overall impressions and gut instinct was a gut rather instinct, than detailed policy. Uh, and, you know, it doesn't matter why or how people vote. It just matter, and What matters is, is the result in the end. The more I think about it, the more I read about it, the more I'm, I'm more surprised that it wasn't actually more in favour of leave as opposed yeah. to less in favour of leave because yeah. you realise what how you know the, the manifestation of people's uh, true sort of um, displeasure and, and um, lack of contentment understandably you know in their own particular and pickle. of course no serious case for Remain had been made over the previous decade yeah, and or also, the previous two decades or the previous three decades I said this is somebody they didn't like it and they wanted to move on uh, having the same conversation on this show I said you know the thing about the, the two campaigns is Remain is, remain is a statu stationary word it's yeah. a it's a non do it, it yeah. is a verb in a way, but it doesn't suggest movement. And leave suggests movement. And as human beings, we are programmed to progress. Chris, have you ever thought of giving up your very lucrative career as a broadcaster and operating as a political consultant? Because I think you'd probably be able to offer some pretty <laughs> wise advice about how people should play to the emotions <laughs> and deploy emotional intelligence rather yeah, well, than just sort think, of intellectual intelligence. But I think if you play to, if you, if you, if you, if I did that, for example, I know it's a joke, but if you say, say I did that, mm. and we have experience of it because we read paper, because it's our job to look, we, there's, we have distance, and distance can be very useful. We're not as clever as people that are involved in the, the hubbub of things, but we, perspective can sometimes outdo intellect. And, um, and also because we're relaxed, we don't get caught up in the knot of, of, of what, of sense, as it were. So, so we can see things, it's all fine. But you couldn't, I don't think you could employ that as a play because that would be morally wrong. But what you could do is point out to the side that may be being played that they are being played yeah. and then let them do what they have to do. That's, yeah. what, that's what, what I think is quite interesting. But if you take an emotional a situation, an emotional vote, an emotional election, an emotional result in, into the House of Commons, the emotion continues. And that's what we saw, wasn't it? It was all this, it was four years of emotion. It was like, oh my God, somebody put this fire out. Well, I think. I think there was a real parallel between Parliament and the country. People often make the point that Parliament didn't resolve Brexit until the 59th minute after the 11th hour, you know, by resolving to have a general election. But I think my point is that 
Parliament was divided as the country was divided. And just as the country kept debating Brexit and in the end was suffering from Brexit fatigue, Chris, the House of Commons, in a sense, was suffering from Brexit fatigue as well. The arguments were played out over and over and over again. And people felt they had to make their point over and over and over again because the other side was doing so. Yeah. Not just the other side of the house, but the other side of the argument. So in the end, although colleagues frequently perform brilliantly, and I've got huge respect for my parliamentary colleagues, I think some of the irascibility that you found in the country was played out in the chamber. People were getting fed up with each other. Yeah. And part of it was fatigue and tiredness and exhaustion, really. I think what happened in the end, and it's only what I think, I think it took as long as it had to. I Actually, you know, we were all, we go, oh, why is it taking four years? I think it probably had to take four years to, to burn itself out. The whole thing had to burn itself out for it to have any chance of being OK now. Well, I completely defend the last parliament, to be honest. I know it isn't popular to do so and it's widely decried and some ministers said that the last parliament was a disgrace and it had no moral right to sit and all the rest of it. I don't actually agree with that i think that colleagues were trying to grapple with a very difficult situation what did brexit mean what did it look like what did it imply did it mean coming out the customs union or the single market or not what was the deal and i think mps were absolutely entitled and indeed required to do what mps are supposed to do which is to say what they think and to vote with their conscience. Now, that wasn't always popular, and me saying that might not be very popular, but it is my honest opinion. And I think those MPs also on both sides of the House and both sides of the Brexit divide, Chris, who stood apart from party and said, no, I dare to be different, deserve some credit because it's very easy just to go with the party line, sometimes to resolve to stand aside from the crowd and be a bit of a loner, is the right thing to do, but it can be a pretty chilly climate. Well, so, you know, any any decent psychologist worth their salt will say, you know, in order for there to be a breakthrough, sometimes there has to be a breakdown, and it's the mm. only way through. And I think that's what happened. Yeah. Uh, right, um, this this man who you used to have to tell to, to behave a lot, what was his name? The noisiest man in the house? Oh, the noisiest man in the house, and I've trumpeted this fact in Zurich and Chicago and New York and Boston when making public speeches, is a guy called Carl Turner, absolutely delightful man, the Labour Member of Parliament for Kingston-upon-Hull East. He is given to yelling at the government, shocking, it's a disgrace, and then he'll point at a particular minister and say, behave, whilst <laughs> conspicuously failing to do so himself. So I often remonstrated with him, sort of along the lines of, oh, dear, <laughs> Mr Turner, calm yourself. If necessary, go and lie down in a dark room and take some sort of soothing medicament and you will find it therapeutic. The great thing about Carl, who went from naught to 60 in about five seconds, was that... He knew that he'd misbehaved and he would then come beetling up to the chair afterwards to atone for his error. And he would look at me very sort of open faced and no dissembling. And he would say, Mr. Speaker, I'm sorry. I know I lost my rag. I found it absolutely infuriating and I knew I was in for a telling off. <laughs> and uh, let, let me ask you this. Now it's all over. You know, a new beginning, because where there's, there's a new beginning. Um, you, you, your identity was Speaker of the House of Commons. Obviously, you're a person within your own right, and you're, you're a husband, and uh, you're a dad, and all those other things that go, go on. Uh, but what, what are you now? What, what do you see now for the next five, ten years? Or is there a plan? Is, what do you want to do? Well, I'm going to try and to earn a living, have some fun, and do some good. I'm doing a lot of public speaking. My late father used to say, John, generally speaking, is generally speaking. <laughs> and I'm doing a lot of public speaking, principally to commercial audiences and so on. I've got an academic post at Royal Holloway College, London University. I love universities and I enjoy going to them, talking to students, hearing from them, engaging with them. I'm Chancellor of my old university, the University of Essex, a fantastic institution to which I feel but they're everlasting all, gratitude. They're all labels, though. What do you, what do you, what do you want to be inside? Where's what do the, I want to the, be where's inside? Where's the ambition? Where's the ambition? I don't have an ambition for any elected office. Right. I feel that the pinnacle of my career was to serve as Speaker, which was a huge privilege. I'm completely relaxed about the fact that some people will think I did a good job and other people won't. I did it honestly. I tried to be a reformer. I tried to keep the best and improve the rest. If you ask me what do I want to do now... By the way, that can include putting your feet up by a lovely sandy beach somewhere. You don't have to do things that... Well, I can do a little bit of that, but, you know, I'm 57 and I've got a wife that I want to support who does a fantastic job 
in the home, but I want to support her and our three children by working. And realistically, I need to continue working for some time to come. So I don't really have a great career plan as such, but I'm enjoying the things I'm doing. And I'm very interested, if you ask me to pick something, in corporate social responsibility. I'm really interested in trying to promote social mobility because for all the good things that have happened in this country over the last 50 years or so, and there are many good things that have happened, greater equality before the law, gender equality, LGBT equality, racial equality and so on, there are still lots of problems in this country and too often how far you get depends on the school you went to, the family into which you were born, whether your parents have got money. This and is it, you though, isn't it? You're talking about yourself a little bit here. That this is a bad thing. Yeah, I mean, I won't say that I was incredibly poor as a child, but I come from a sort of lower middle class, stroke working class background, and I've had to fight for everything, and I've often had to contend with snobbery and anti-Semitism and so on, and, and that plays out. You get it all the time. I had it indeed throughout my speakership, a small cohort of people who were very sniffy, very disdainful, very superior looked at me as as though they got a smell under their nose. I've always had that. My father had to put up with that. It's absolutely predictable. And you just have to cope with it as best you can. But I really like the idea of assisting those who are doing things to ensure that people of ability and commitment, but without dosh, can prevail, whether it be academically, commercially, in sport. And, you know, for example, in my own sport of tennis... I think it's a great sport, but too often people who've got real ability don't get plucked from the crowd and given the chance to play. Tennis is actually rather an expensive sport. I mean, Andy Murray is an exception, state school boy, but Andy Murray, of course, was blessed with a magnificent tennis playing and tennis coaching mum. Mum. And so, in a sense, and brother in Jamie. So, and, you know, his grandparents were tennis players and I think coaches and so on. So, Andy is the exception that proves the rule. There are lots and lots and lots of working class kids who can't afford tennis equipment, who couldn't pay for lessons, and the LTA, the Royal Tennis Association, is doing what it can to reach out to those people. But I think probably a lot more can be done. It sounds to me like you're thinking out loud. There, you know you want to do... You want to find a higher purpose, you know, become a force for good, and you're just having a little think about those well, things. Well, I don't think it's a great idea to jump into things. You know, I think when you leave... A role. There's a lot to be said for taking a period in which you reflect and you talk to people and you hear from people and you don't rush into commitments going at them, if you like, half cock and then regretting it. So quite a lot of people whom I very much respect, commercial people and others, said to me, John, take at take, least take six five. months. Yeah, yeah. You know, and think okay. about it. Well, well, but I you... like to think I've got a contribution to make. But now you don't have the therapy of the commons to go to. Uh, where will where will your rage? Where will your rage? Um, how will it find its outlet? Because there, there is there is this inner rage. There, well, there's a passion. I think the passion tends to come out in speeches, in particular. I enjoy talking to audiences, and I do tend to hang it all out there. I'm, I suppose, as you would say, emotional or passionate. I don't believe in this sort of stiff upper lip. Jolly poor show to express one's views too forcefully. I do express my views forcefully, though I hope with courtesy. And I'm a good listener. (laughs) I love meeting people. (laughs) And I see the best most of the time in people. I can be argumentative. But I love human relationships and I find them fun. I'm very much a people person, not a sit-behind-desk-and-do-admin person. Right, we're way over. Uh, it's five past nine. One more question before you go. Um, did did you get the phone call from I'm a Celebrity or not? No. They didn't, didn't call you? No. Did, were the, you expecting it? No, I you... didn't want it. No, there was a talent agent, <laughs> right. Chris, who phoned me up and said she understood that I was considering going on the programme. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but you're quite wrong about that. Right. I'm not considering it, and I wouldn't do so under any circumstances at any time. Whereupon, why, why not? Why wouldn't you do that? Oh, because I think it's a trashy programme. Right. And I think it would trash my brand. Look, if people want to do it, then good luck to them. And some of the people who gone on it are really good people it doesn't appeal to me and actually i'll give you another reason fingers I out fingers out fingers out another that was reason, a big point then that's a on. big point i'll tell you why i wouldn't got it i'm very into self-protection and the idea of going in the jungle and taking some risks or experiencing extreme discomfort or a horrible taste from having to eat something absolutely you. disgusting is not for me it's not only undignified i think it's really unpleasant and it's You have to be honest about yourself and with yourself, and it's not me. The Chris Evans Breakfast Show with Sky.